we may start by reciting Surah Al-Fatiha in honor of Sayyidah Narjis, Mother of our 12th Imam. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله بارئ الخلائق الأجمعين بائث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء حبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد الصلاة والسلام على أحد بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين لا سيما ولي الله الأعدم حجة الله ابن الحسن صاحب العصر والزمان روحي وأرواح العالمين له الفداء ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الحكيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنا نزلنا الذكرى وإنا له لحافظون صدق الله العلي العظيم وآمنا به صلوا على محمد وعلى محمد The Quran was one of the greatest miracles and most powerful miracles used by Rasulullah to establish his claim of truthfulness and to establish his claim that he was divine, that he was a divinely sent prophet from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you look into the history of all the prophets, there was a prophet from amongst that nation, a person from amongst that community, regular person, part of the tribes, part of the environment, who would come up after living a certain amount of his life within that environment and then claim to be a divine person, claim to be a prophet, claim to be a person who is representing the justice and the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for the rest of the people, Salah ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. For, for, so for the rest of the people and the community in general to believe in this person to be a prophet, he needed to come up with something with a miracle which was extraordinary. Something above and beyond the level of the regular people. Something above the intellect which would prove and distinguish the Prophet from the rest of the people in his claim that he is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which is why you will see Nabi Isa during his time medicine as a science had reached its peak. It was at the highest level at that time there was a cure for almost every form of disease, every form of sickness but there was no cure of death. So Nabi Isa, in order to claim or in order to prove his truthfulness, came about with a miracle in the field of medicine, something that no other doctor, no other level of science was able or medicine was able to provide. What was that? Nabi Isa was able to raise the dead back to life. Medicine, regardless of how much it had advanced at that age, the doctors were not at, an able, were not at a stage to bring back the death to life. So Nabi Isa came about with this miracle to show that I am distinguished and above you and this power that I have to alter the nature of creation is a power granted to me by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he used his miracle as a base to prove his truthfulness in his claim of prophethood. And the same thing with Rasulullah when he came to the Meccan community after living with them for 40 years. They said to him, Ya Muhammad, give us proof that you were divinely sent by Rasulullah. You were a person who was an orphan, 
who grew up in the house of Abu Talib, who was a trader in joint venture with Sayyida Khadija. Yes, you had good morals, but you being a common man from our community, all of a sudden you come one day after 40 years and say that you are a prophet from Allah and your obedience is necessary. Give us proof, give us claim. So the norm of the Arabian Peninsula or the Arabian culture at that time was poetry. The Arabian people in terms of poetry and literacy had reached a peak, the highest level. So Rasulullah came with a miracle, that miracle being the Quran, which in its eloquence and its conciseness and its taste in poetry, in the way the Arabic words and in which the grammar is used, baffled the people. And they knew from here, the fact that the Quran, despite its conciseness, had depth in its message, they recognized that they had to be an external creator, somebody above mankind who has created this Quran because of its eloquence. So the first issue is that the Quran in itself was used by the Holy Prophet to establish his truthfulness, number one. Number two, the Quran in itself is a book of guidance. Eternal book of guidance for all mankind. Within the Quran, you will find rules and regulations and etiquettes on how to worship your creator. Within the Quran, you will find the etiquettes on how a person should act in his marriage life. Within the Quran, you will find the etiquettes on how a person should act in his business life. Within the Quran, you will find an entire political system, the framework of which is listed in the Quran. An entire economic system, the framework is found inside the Quran. For every major thing and minor thing that everybody within the circle of humanity needs is listed in the Quran. So the Quran, in essence, is a manual and a code of practice for each and every human being in order to succeed in this life and in the hereafter. If we understand these two opening statements, then it becomes important for us to analyze this verse of the Quran which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put down, where he says, as we listed or as we recited in the beginning of the khutbah, inna nazzalna al-dhikra, Dhikra as in remembrance. Remembrance is a term used or dhikr is a term simultaneously used or interchangeably used for the word Quran. We have revealed to you the Quran. And we are, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the protectors of the Quran. Tayyib. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states he's the protector of the Quran, he's protecting the Quran from what or against what? This is the first question we ask. To answer this question, we will give two perspectives. Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran promises us that he will protect the Quran from any sort of misinterpretation. And this is by providing us with teachers and the imams who have understood the Quran, who are a part of the Quran, and the Quran is a part of them. So Allah protects the meanings and the interpretation of the Quran by providing us with infallible prophets or infallible imams. So long as you seek guidance or you understand the Quran through the interpretation of the Ahlul Bayt, you can never go astray. And the message of the Quran will always be protected. And I see how other schools of thought that have left the madhab of Ahlul Bayt have gone astray using the Quran. They do or they commit kufr and shirk using the Quran. Refer back to, for example, Sayyid Bukhari. In one of the tafsir of his verses where he says, وَتَكُولْ حَلْ مِنَ الْمَزِيدِ In Sayyid Bukhari, you will see that there is a hadith that says, on the day of judgment, the hellfire will be roaring. Whereas the sinners are being put into the hellfire. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the hadith in Sayyid Bukhari. Allah will call out to the hellfire. Hal imtala'at, are you full? And the fire of hell will cry back out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and will say, Hal min al mazid, is there more people to throw into hellfire because I have the capacity? 
So the hellfire wants to be quenched now or wants to be filled up. So the hadith tell us that Allah will disclose his leg and he'll put his leg into the hellfire and then the hellfire will say enough, enough. Alaykum bil haq. Any person with akal, does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have a leg? Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have a body? For 23 years, Rasulullah broke his back teaching the message of Tawheed, ensuring that the Ummah does not fall into the traps of Kufr or Shirk or attributing a body to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 1400 years later, mashallah, the Ummah of Islam is using the Quran to show that Allah has a body. And Ba'ad, even from a logical perspective, this hadith has flaws. Why did Allah choose his leg and not his hand? Why did Allah choose the leg and not the head? And then from the hadith, do we know whether it is the right leg or a left leg? Do we know that the leg of Allah is a masculine leg or a feminine leg? Is it a leg with hair or a leg that has been waxed? Shunu'ai, nonsense. All these hadith found within the book of the Muslims. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guarantees us that we cannot go astray in understanding the message of the Quran, number one. And number two, the message of the Quran is protected so long as the people refer back to the Ahlul Bayt in its interpretation. This is one. Protecting the Quran from wrong, or from wrong interpretations or from misinterpretations. So, number one. Number two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised us that he has protected the Quran from each and every type of tahrif. Tahrif yani distortion. Distortion of the Quran or distortion of the contents present in the Quran could be in a number of forms. Number one, they could be addition. Yani for example, a surah has five verses and people came and added another verse onto it later on. So it becomes six. This is one type of distortion. Addition to the content. Number two, or a second type of tahrif is distortion of, or reduction of the content. For example, a surah has five verses, somebody went and cancelled one verse and now that Quran has four verses. So the second type of dis distortion is deduction of the content. And number third is that somebody comes and changes the words in itself. If the Quran says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, somebody came and said, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Rabbid dunya. He changed one word for another, substituted one word for another. So any type of addition, deduction, or substitution of the content of the Quran is termed as tahrif. Allah says we protect the Quran even from that tahrif. If the Quran is not distorted in content or in meaning, and our, or our debate for tonight is protection of the content of the Quran from tahrif. How was the Quran protected from tahrif throughout all these generations? Two quick answers which we can discuss is that firstly, the Quran, if the content of the Quran was to be protected, that means Rasulullah must have ensured that there were a number of companions during his time who had memorized the Quran. And through their memory, the Quran's content was protected in their hearts. And they would be teachers for other companions. Which is why you will see many people are listed in history who are known as Hafidul Quran at the time of Rasulullah. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was one of them. Sayyida Fidda was a hafidah of the Quran such that it is narrated that ever since she had memorized the Quran she never spoke to anybody in any other sentence except that she used the Quran in her conversation. So this gives us proof that people had memorized the Quran and Rasulullah encouraged people to memorize the Quran so that it can be protected, it can be remembered for the future generations. This is number one. Number two, if you have a message, this message is the Quran, and this Quran is supposed to be eternal guidance for mankind until the day of judgment, how do you protect this Quran? How do you protect this message? The most logical thing to do is to write down the message. Enter today, if you have an important announcement or you have an important task or an important message, to pass on to somebody else, what do you do just to make sure you don't forget it or it's not changed or it's not 
distorted. What do you do? You record it by writing it down. So the same thing with the Quran. The logical answer for protecting the Quran and ensuring that its content reaches the future generations without being distorted was to write it down. To write it down, to collate it, and to compile the Quran. These are the two ways in which the Quran was protected. Tayyip. If we understand this, then the question is, or the next question is, who compiled the Quran and when was the Quran compiled? We start with the second question. When was the Quran compiled? If you read regular books of history, and if you read regular books of Ulum al-Quran, Islamic history, taught within the seminaries or outside the seminaries, or even at a more simpler level, if you look at the AS level syllabus, which is taught here in the United Kingdom, Islamic studies at the AS level, if you open the syllabus on the debate of the Quran or the subject of the Quran, there is a whole section on how the Quran was compiled or by whom it was compiled. You will see that if you take all these three sources together, the general situation is like this, that Rasulullah left behind the Quran in the form of Rasulullah had left behind the Quran in the forms of scrolls and pieces of papers and dry leaves and carvings and goat skin and sheep skin some in this one's house some in that one's house and then he passed away and then there was the battle of Yamama and a lot of the Hufad of the Quran were killed so Abu Bakr came to Zayd ibn Thabit and he said, you know what, we have to embark upon a really important task. And this is compilation of the Quran. So the first time that the thinking about or the first time a person thought about compiling the Quran as a whole like we have today was at the time of Abu Bakr. So he thought about it. During the time of Omar, this thinking continued, this uh, collecting of all these scrolls and pieces of paper continued until the time of Uthman. Uthman ibn Affan came and he said that the Ummah has been without a Quran. This is unacceptable. He brought all the remaining companions of the Prophet who are alive, all the scrolls that were there, sat them down together, wrote one master copy of the Quran and distributed towards the Muslim lands. Every other copy of the Quran was burnt and trashed. And this is the history of our Quran. The Quran that we have today between our hands, the Mus'haf, was a compilation of Uthman ibn Affan when he became the Khalif of the Muslim Ummah. This is the version of history which is given to us either at the AS level or within the books of Ulum al-Quran, inside or outside majority of the seminaries and majority of the books of history. Now we want to analyze this. Did Uthman truly compile the Quran or is this a fabrication in history? Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Our first objection is the objection that Uthman came into Khilafah or attained the position of Khilafah 12 to 15 years after the death of Rasulullah. Which means, according to this version of history, that the Quran or the Muslim Ummah were deprived of a Quran for 15 years until Uthman came. What was the Muslim Ummah doing at that time? Where did they seek guidance from? Just now we said that in the Quran there is guidance for entire humanity in the smallest thing to the biggest thing. If the Quran was not there as one collated, one completed, one compiled version, where were the Muslims going for guidance? And at that time, there was a lot of expeditions where there was, ter there was people with the Islamic army was conquering vast territories. At the time of Omar, the Islamic Ummah had reached until Spain. All these new Spanish people who have converted into Islam, how were they getting access to the Quran on a daily basis? Who was there to teach them? Were there enough companions who had memorized the entire Quran from the time of Rasulullah at the time of Uthman? What was the Muslim Ummah doing at that time? If the Quran was not present, does this mean that the Muslims who sinned because they didn't know the rules of Quran are forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Were they exempted from the Quran or not? Ishqal number one. There is no answer given to us from history on that. 
Number two, again, the Ishqal comes back on Abu Bakr, or the objection comes back to Abu Bakr. Because the books of history tell us that after the battle of Yamama, a large number of the memorizers of the Quran were killed. So as we said, Abu Bakr comes to Zayd ibn Thabit and he says to him, Ya Zayd, we have to embark upon a great task. He said, and what task is this? He said, we have to compile the Quran because it is extremely important for the Ummah. Tayyib, enter Abu Bakr, leader of the Khalifa, have enough sense to worry about the Ummah. You are worried enough to make sure that there is a fully compiled copy of the Quran for the Ummah. But Rasulullah didn't have this intellect. Rasulullah didn't have these concerns. Being the Prophet upon whom the Wahi has uh, revealed upon, why didn't he take the same measures to protect the Quran? Does it mean that you are more concerned about the Ummah than Rasulullah? Do you know more about Islam than Rasulullah? Number two, why did, why even if Rasulullah, for example, for argument's sake, did not compile the Quran, why you trust, why are you passing over Rasulullah? So the objection comes back to them. Salu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So to answer to these objections, we come and we need to analyze these, the compilation of the Quran in its true sense. During the time of Rasulullah, we have substantial proof and we have concrete proof that the Quran that we hold between our hands, the Quran or the copy of the Quran that we possess in our hands today is the same copy of the Quran in the same order which Rasulullah had compiled during his time. Which is why we are able to 100% say that the Quran that we possess is free of any tahrif. Yes, the Quran is known to have an Uthmani font, but this Quran as a book, as a compilation in its tartib is the same that was there at Rasulullah. How? What are our proofs? Proof number one. The verse of the Quran, most Mufassirin say, is the last verse of the Quran to be revealed. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَاتَّقُوا يَوْمًا تُرْجَعُونَ فِيهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ this verse was revealed seven days before the martyrdom of Rasulullah. So Mufassirin say, majority of them say, this is the last verse to be revealed in the Quran. If we refer back to tafsir of Sayyid Shabbar, he says in his commentary that when this verse was revealed, the last verse of the Quran, seven days before Rasulullah passed away, Jibra'il came down to Rasulullah and he said to him the, about this verse ala ra'asi wa min al Jibra'il comes down to Rasulullah and he tells Rasulullah this verse that we have just revealed yawman. Um, fihi ilallah this verse, Jibra'il tells Rasulullah, I want you to place it at the end of the 280th verse of Surah Al-Baqarah. What does this show us? This shows us that even the placement of the verses, which, goes, which verse goes where, was a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Rasulullah by Jibra'il. This is not an order for any Tom, Dick and Harry, any Zayd, Ali to come and put which verse of the Quran wherever they want. Sure, no, this is the book of guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even the placement of the verses was an order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even the order of the verses was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Jibra'il over here makes clear for us two things. That the verse... The placement of the verses are from him and the fact that he mentioned Surah Al-Baqarah gives us enough proof that even the order of the surahs was something that was commanded by Jibra'il. This is the first proof. From here, we need to point out to two different things. There is an issue known as Tanzil and there is an issue known as Tartib. Tanzil of the Quran and Tartib of the Quran. 
As yesterday we mentioned, revelation of the Quran was of two types. There was one revelation which was known as Daf'i, the entire Quran revealed upon the heart of Rasulullah that happened on Laylatul Qadr. And the second type of revelation happened Tadrijiyan, gradually over 23 years. This is one issue, revelation of the Quran. The second issue is Tartib of the Quran. Organizing the Quran in certain chapters with certain verses following and preceding others. Revelation of the Quran and the verses in the order in which they were revealed does not coincide with the placement of the verses in the Quran. The first verse of the Quran to be revealed was which? Ikra bismi khalaq. Yet in the Quran, the first verse is what? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. So revelation of the verses had its own order and placement of the Quran as a written book with organized chapters and verses is a different issue and they do not coincide with one another. So this is the first proof that Jibra'il came down and commanded Rasulullah to place this verse at the end of the 280th verse. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salla ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The second proof is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran himself, in Surah Al-Qiyamah says that the compilation of the Quran is our task. He says in Surah Al-Qiyamah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa inna alayna jam'ahu wa Qur'ana. He says it is upon us, jam'ah, to gather the Quran and it is upon us to make sure that its recitation will continue throughout the end of time. So we come to the tafsir of our sixth imam. The sixth imam says when Allah says it is our responsibility to gather the Quran, Imam Sadiq says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ensured that he completes his responsibility through Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma aswala ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us it is his responsibility to ensure that the Quran is compiled, this means that Allah has selected a certain group of people who represent him and represent his justice and represent his message who are in charge of compiling the Quran. Which is why our sixth Imam says in the hadith that Rasulullah came once to Amirul Mu'mineen and he said, Ya Ali, Al-Quran, he says that Ya Ali one of the days while the Prophet was alive he went to Amir al muminin and he said to him Ya Ali there are certain parts of the Quran that are written in scrolls they are behind my bed they are in scrolls and they are pieces of paper take them and collect them so a person from the ahl sunnah will come he might come up to us and tell us we cannot accept your hadith because this is a hadith from the shia it is a hadith from imam sadiq and we don't recognize imam sadiq when a person comes and tells you this from the ahl al-khilaf you tell me excuse me please sit down number one from the sunni which school of the sunnah are you are you a hanbali if you are a hanbali ahmad ibn hanbal was the student of imam sadiq are you a Hanafi? Because Abu Hanifa was also the student of Imam as sadiq Malik ibn Anas was also a student of Imam as sadiq And even Shafi'i was a student of Imam as sadiq Han Abu Hanifa used to say, Lawla as sanatain la nu'man. Had it not been for the two years that I studied my fiqh under Imam Jafar sadiq even I would have been astray. So no one from the Ahl Sunnah has a right to come and tell you that Imam Sadiq is not a hujjah. Imam Sadiq says that my grandfather Amir al muminin compiled the Quran, finish. Ba'ad. Number one. Number two, within the same bracket, is that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made a covenant that he is the one to be in charge of compiling the Quran in the order in which it is, then who is Uthman and who are the rest of the companions to come against the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Over here there is no need of ijtihad. Over here there is no need for any companion to come forward and be, like we say in Gujarati, to be dodayo. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I am in charge of arranging the Quran in the way I want. So who are these sahabis who come and be, again in Swahili, the way we say, Kimbele Mbele. Allah has said that this is the order I have. Enter, who are you to come and change the order of the Quran? And even if you do that, then you have gone against the Quran. So the hujjah is against you. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Another set of proof is that during the time, Sheikh Mufid says, during the time of Rasulullah, there were a number of companions who had memorized the Quran in its entirety. And they would come to Rasulullah, and in front of Rasulullah, they would recite the Quran. How does a person memorize the Quran from the beginning to the end if the Quran in itself was not a compiled piece, was not a book? There would be no beginning, there would be no end. It means that they are memorizing random scrolls. La, over here, the hadith tell us they had memorized the entire Quran. And after finishing the memorization of the Quran and recitation of the Quran, they would recite the surah or the dua known as Khatmul Quran. The dua for completion of the Quran. If the Quran was not completed in its compilation, it was not a book that could be read from the first cover to the last page, why would there be a dua called Khatmul Quran? Don't call it Khatmul Quran. Call it Khatam of one scroll or two scrolls or one piece of goat skin. La, over here, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Zayd ibn Thabit were known to have completed reciting the entire Quran in front of Rasulullah and he would correct them on their makhraj for example or would correct them in their understanding of these verses. So this is another proof that the Quran in its entirety was compiled and available for the entire Muslim ummah during the lifetime of Rasulullah, not even after. The Quran being the most important book of guidance, it was of utmost importance for Rasulullah to make sure that it was fully compiled and available and accessible to all the Muslims. Another proof that the Quran was compiled during the time of Rasulullah. One of his last statements where he says on his deathbed or before the days he passed away, he says to the Ummah, Inni tarikun fikum uffakalain, kitabullahi wa itrati ahla bayti. The Prophet says, Inni tarikun fikum uffakalain, I'm leaving behind for you two important things, two weighty things. The first of them is kitabullah, the Quran. Look at how Rasulullah describes the Quran. He uses the word kitabullah for the Quran. Kitab. Come back to Arabic language. What does the word kitab mean? You open the dictionary or any lexicon such as Lisan al Arab. You see, kitab is a word used where they say in definition, dhammu shay ila shay, am jam o shay ila shay, am shay alladhi huwa maktub fih. The kitab is a word used for anything that is collated and compiled together that has two covers. If the Quran, you use the term book or kitab, that means it must be compiled and collated in one exact copy, in one place. Kitab as a word, as a noun, is not applicable to a number of random writings dispersed in different places across different times. If a person uses the word kitab to describe that, that means he has either a poor choice of words or is illiterate. So choose either Rasulullah wal ayyadu billah is illiterate or the Quran was uncompiled. Rasulullah is saying, in Italy, kitabullah. Enter in a university you're studying, you have one textbook. And then you have random short notes written in full caps. Some of them in your room, some of them in your dormitory, some of them in your locker. These separate full caps of rough notes that are scattered over different places. Can you say that this is a book? <laughs> it's laughable. You say a book is what is together compiled, has a front cover, back cover, front page and page. And Rasulullah, when he used the word Kitabullah to refer to the Quran, is sufficient proof for us to show that the Quran was available in its entirety during the time of Rasulullah. A further proof to that is that during the last days of Rasulullah, when he said, which is known as, this day is known as Radiyatul Khamis, 
the calamity of Thursday. Where Rasulullah gathered his companions and he said to them on his deathbed, and this is recorded in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. He said to his Muslim Ummah, will you not bring for me or can you bring for me a pen and a paper such that I may write for you my last wishes? Umar ibn Khattab stood up and he said, Hasbuna kitabullah. We don't need Rasulullah to write anything for us. In fact, he's delirious. Well, ayadu billah. So at this time, your second Khalifa is saying, Hasbuna kitabullah. The book of Allah is sufficient for us. So from the proof of Umar ibn Khattab, the words of Umar himself, we come to know that Kitab, the Quran in itself, was present at the time of Rasulullah. So either Umar was wrong in his statement or Uthman has committed a fraud because he is claiming to be the compiler of the Quran. Choose which one of them is it. For ahna in history, when we want to, we are not here to, you know, you know when we make, when we have the discussions like these or conversations like this, we are not here to tarnish anyone's madhab or to, to mock anybody. Rather, we are holding an academic discussion where we are trying to see that there are discrepancies in history. There are discrepancies in statement like this. And we are people of haq. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us an akal so that we may discover haq through conversations like these, through discussions like these. And these, inshallah, are a path which we can use into understanding the history and the originality of the Quran. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The last proof that the Quran in itself was compiled during the time of Rasulullah in the surahs that we find right now with the verses in the way they are right now is the name of the first surah of the Quran, Al-Fatiha. And we pointed towards this during our lecture. The first verse to be revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was what? Ikra bismi rabbika alladhi khala. From Surah Al-Ikra. Yet, in the compilation of the Quran, Surah Al-Hamd is known as what? Surah Al-Fatiha, the opening. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala named this surah as the opening, despite it not being the first surah to be revealed. This shows us, again, reinforcing our point that revelation of the verses is a different issue and compilation of the Quran and arranging the surahs in the way they are was a different issue altogether. Both these issues were decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hence, our claim that the Quran was not compiled by Uthman during the time of Uthman. Rather, the correct opinion is that it was compiled during the time of Rasulullah. And it was ordered, the compilation of the Quran was a task ordered by Rasulullah for Amir al muminin to perform. Hence, it was a complete book even before Rasulullah passed away. How can he pass away leaving the Ummah without the Quran? Yet the Quran is a source of guidance for them. Now a person might come up with an objection. And he will say, after Sakifa, Amir al muminin said that he will go into his house and he will not wear his rida until he finishes compiling the Quran. This is a tradition that we hear many times and he didn't participate in any of those political events that went on. What was Amir al muminin doing at that time? When we say that Amir al muminin said he, will, he took another or an oath that he will not come out of his house in order to compile the Quran, what Amir al muminin in reality was doing was writing or authoring, excuse me, an entire tafsir of the Quran according to the Asbab al Nuzul. Yani for every verse that was revealed, there was an occasion for which this verse was revealed. There was a reason for which this verse was revealed. There were particular circumstances and situations which surrounded the revelation of this verse. Because Amir al muminin was with Rasulullah from the first day of Risala until the last day of Risala, he had full knowledge about all the events that surrounded the revelation of the verse. So he sat down in the house to start to compile the first tafsir of the Quran, which is known as Mus'haf Ali. And then he went out to the community and he said to them, this is the tafsir that I have compiled. Can you have a look at it for the ummah for guidance? And then the narrations tell us that there were some companions who opened the Quran and the first surah that they opened was Surah Al-Munafikun. All their names are listed in this tafsir. So they said to Amir al-Mu'minin, we don't want this tafsir. What we have between us is sufficient. 
So Amir al muminin at that time was not compiling the Quran. Rather, he was compiling the tafsir of the Quran. Salu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Having said this, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us tawfiq and ma'rifah in reading the Quran. To give us tawfiq and ma'rif, to give us tawfiq in reading the Quran and to bless us with ma'rifah through understanding of the Quran. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for during these nights of Shahrul Ramadan, these last nights, Ya Allah, bless us and give us barakah in our fasting. If there are any sins which you have still not forgiven, O oh Allah, we beseech you by these nights to forgive us our sins. We ask you, Ya Allah, by your right and by the right of Amir al Mu'minin, all our family, friends, and relatives who are not in the best of health, you grant them shafa'a. All our friends and relatives who have passed away, you make for them their graves and barzak into a realm of Jannah. We pray to you, Ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to hasten the reappearance of our 12th Imam. And to make us from his companions. Wa akhir al-da'wana. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Salaam ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.